everybody. Nice to see you this evening. I am Chris Wall. I am the executive producer of the Wing Feather Saga uh, animated series. So good to have you. We have a really fun night together. Uh, if this is your first time ever seeing me or tuning in, uh, welcome. Nice to meet you. Uh, I am so excited to tell you all about what we've been doing over this last week. Uh, in one week, a lot of stuff has happened. A lot of stuff has happened. And uh, we're uh, talking about our Wing Feather Saga. This is a fantastic book series, if you're not familiar, um, that is uh, written by a guy named Andrew Peterson. Uh, he's not able to be here this evening. His uh, son uh, is getting married. Uh, the wedding was today. And so he has other things to attend to, as you can imagine. Uh, so tonight I get to be with you, but we have a very special guest, uh, actually a couple surprise guests that I'm excited to introduce as well, and uh, we're going to have you all um, uh, filled in with all kinds of information. Today we're really going to talk a lot about uh, the visual style of, of the wing feather world. Um, it's a world that's called Air We Are. I'll tell you more about that later, uh, but that is the name of the world, and, and we're super um, excited to tell you about that. Um, so if you just crashed in, uh, again, I'm Chris Wall, executive producer. Uh, I spent many years uh, working at uh, VeggieTales producing that series and then joined with Andrew a number of years ago uh, to begin developing uh, these awesome books that our family had read together and uh, uh, bring it to life as an animated series. And so we announced our partnership with Angel Studios uh, and uh, they have been just awesome. You may have seen uh, one of their other shows like Drive Our Comedy or maybe The Chosen. Um, uh, we're big fans here at the Wall Household. Uh, and so uh, tonight, we're going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. So a week ago, uh, uh, we announced that we had this really interesting opportunity where rather than just being fans of the show, uh, you all could invest and get actual shares and own parts of our company. So in, in, the, in the real world, this is called Regulation CF Crowdfunding. Uh, this is not a donation. We are not asking for donations. We're not asking for you to give money like on a Kickstarter. Uh, this is actually asking you to go buy shares in our company. And so over the course of this last week, uh, a lot of you, 3,543 according to our little ticker there, uh, have jumped in and invested with us. Uh, and it has been an amazing, uh, it's been an amazing week. Um, what this offers as an opportunity is kind of the ultimate fan experience that that you get to hold those shares and come along with us as investors uh, over the next few years. Uh, and that really is a timetable. We've had that question chop up a lot this week, but it is uh, the next three, five years. Who knows? Uh, we'd love to make uh, multiple seasons, uh, taking all the way through the book series. Um, some have asked, you know, this is a narrative series, so it's more like Avatar Last Airbender, if you ever saw that, the old Nickelodeon show. Um, or maybe Clone Wars, where there is a beginning, middle, and end. We're actually driving to a conclusion. The episodes just don't keep going. We've got a story we're trying to tell and get you through. And how long we do that, how many episodes we do that with, um, that is up to kind of what the opportunity is, uh, how much the audience shows up. Uh, uh, you know, if you remember Lost way back in the day, that old ABC show, uh, their number of series was really squishy, and that got kind of problematic because we didn't know how long it was going to last. <laughs> Uh, in our case, uh, it's all about how much of the story we want to tell. Um, and so with your partnership, we get to do that. Um, so this is buying shares on the ground floor right at the beginning. Uh, we may do another funding round in the future, and the shares will be priced very differently because you have built value in the company. So we are trying to raise $5 million, and over the course of last week, we did really well. Um, and uh, what's at stake here? is that we just got to 2.4 million uh, in a week. And I I'm wondering if maybe by the end of the evening we might be a little higher than that. We'll see. Uh, our, we've kind of broken it out with some episode goals. So like, you know, there's an initial funding amount and then how much per episode, and that's our real budget. Um, and so our next one is at 2.7 million, which is what we're headed to. So we're kind of on track there, which is super cool. Uh, we've had a bunch of people jump on just recently. Uh, I want to call these people out because it's I love doing this because uh, like, when I've been a part of this kind of thing, I just uh, love knowing, hey, I'm, I'm in this. Uh, so Joseph from Kansas uh, invested 250 Thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm reading this right, but Holly uh, from, from Idaho invested $15,000. Thank you. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for believing in us. Uh, we hold that very closely, and uh, I can't tell you the sense of responsibility we have about making that money go to work to make a great series. 
Uh, Kristen from uh, Minnesota, uh, $100. Richard from North Carolina, $350. Nathan from Texas, $500. Joshua from Illinois, $5,000. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, Jane from uh, Massachusetts, $500. Sean from Wisconsin, $2,000. Uh, Evan from Idaho, $500. And Brad from uh, Mississippi, $100. Um, that's amazing. Uh, Michael uh, from Connecticut, a thousand dollars. Thank you. That is really great. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and John from North Carolina just got one in uh, three fifty. Uh, that's really awesome. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of cool stuff tonight and are so excited to uh, share this with you. Um, uh, later in the stream, we've got, um, uh, a special video, uh, that shows a milestone that we got to, uh, and I'm going to get to that later, but, uh, a milestone that we got to that really um, shows the reaction that myself and Andrew had uh, to this uh, amazing thing that happened uh, last Saturday. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Tonight, our special guest is Nicholas Cole. Uh, Nicholas is a wonderful designer, um, and um, he uh, we got a great story about how we got to know each other, uh, which we'd love to get into. Um, if you have questions as we're getting into this, and you're like, "Wait, what?" There's certain funding questions that we really want to see if you can ask on the, the, the site and and the site is super easy it's angel.com slash wing feather angel.com slash wing feather so uh, if you want to go look and see kind of our ticker and what we're doing and how it's working that's where you go thank you for that John uh, angel.com slash wing feather and, and you can kind of track our progress it is a weird thing uh, you know some people when they start their companies they kind of go and get some money from a bank or some from, from some rich uncle or whatever and then you don't really know how much it cost. In our case, you guys know exactly the money we're raising. It's been strange this week. I've actually started doing production calls where I'm starting to start to deal with you know artists who might hire and, and this sort of thing. And they all know exactly how much money we have. That's cool. <laughs> no, it's great. Uh, and, and we are excited to bring some great people on. Um, OK, so if you have questions, though, uh, pop them in here. And we're going to try to. Uh, uh, answer those uh, later in the in the time together so anyways if you have artists in your home and uh, want to spend some time with us tonight it's gonna be a lot of fun uh, so let's get right to it I want to welcome my good friend Nicholas Cole onto the stream here uh, I believe he's gonna patch in let's see aha there he is hey Chris hello sir hello how are you doing good evening is it dark where you are it's beginning to get dark. Yeah. Okay, so it's completely touch. dark. But not here, uh, not nearly as dark as it looks like. A... Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're just in your in your designing space there right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always dim. <laughs> Got to get rid of the screen <laughs> glare and make sure all the colors come through really clear. So. Oh yes, all the colors. Hello, mm -hmm. Nicholas. Good to see you. Hey, so uh, I wanted to start. At, you had mentioned this, and it's so great. Uh, you came on to join us for the Wing Feather Saga short film after we had done our Kickstarter, and uh, and it was introduced in a very funny way. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah, it was wild. I I went and spoke at a college as like a graduation speaker for a senior show, and had a great time, lovely time. Uh, thought you know nothing in particular else beyond that I was grateful and it was good and went home and um unbeknownst to me <laughs> somewhere in the background um a woman who is an alumni of the same uh I didn't attend heard that I had been there like didn't even go to my talk was not did not attend at all just heard that I had been there so I was on her mind and then she had backed the wing feather kickstarter I think at around the same time and saw that you guys were putting a call out or, or indicating that you were looking for artists and had recently seen my portfolio and so she said uh, a man who went to my school she didn't specify to talk so I, I got an email from you saying that a classmate of mine had um, uh, reached out and recommended me um, and I had no idea who that was and 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 we had a, a fun time of untangling all of that but so basically somebody who had never attended my talk that I had not met recommended me because I was on their mind um, based on their own support of your Kickstarter um, and put us in touch to begin with which was really funny that's fantastic yeah I remember that and it was this like yeah. hey Nicholas I got recommended you by this person that you know and you're like cricket yeah <laughs> like, sorry I was like <laughs> who <laughs> yeah, exactly so yeah. Nicholas, it was amazing. Uh, we it was, actually it was a seen a lot of portfolios yeah. of different artists around that time, and uh, Nicholas's stuff immediately leapt off. We were like, "Who is this guy?" 
man, we would love to talk to him and see if we could bring him into this world of wing feather. And so if you don't know this, folks, what you have to do when you're working with an artist is really show them what you're into and try to inspire them. And, and that can be a difficult thing. And I know, Nicholas, you've worked on projects where the inspiration is a little thin. Uh, but thankfully, when we showed you Wing Feather Saga and got you, I think, some audiobooks, as I recall, we started you there and you went, mm -hmm. OK, this is this is really interesting. Uh, talk to me about those early days mm -hmm. of kind of discovering Air We Are. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was very quick that I began to fall in love with the entire world and project. Um, the books speak for themselves. That first book for me, I know, you know, they get incredible and very um dramatic and intense as they go on. And and I know that for your family, that was especially notable. But for me, just coming in on that first chapter or two of uh, In the Edge of the Dark Sea of Darkness and the strange comedy that Andrew weaves in with the fantasy world building was like, oh, it's almost like a feeling of like, oh, no, <laughs> like, I really like this, you know, like, I think I need to do this like fast. Um, and and your email said such wonderful things. I think that you dropped um, Hayao Miyazaki, Studio Ghibli, which always is a big winner for me. And then uh, talked a little bit about your aspirations to make it sort of a painterly project that captured the spirit of of more of like the art of book rather than the sort of finished, polished kind of 3D Pixar look. And all of that just kind of combined. And I was like, oh yeah, we gotta we gotta look into this. Um, yeah, and I think we started with a couple tests at, at the beginning, right? That was like, it was a few of the, the kids. We really did. And I, um, if you remember, I, yeah. I put you in the one place that I learned later is your most miserable, which is a landscape and do, doing buildings. Uh, and so <laughs> your very first like real painting was in downtown Glipwood. You've done some great uh, stuff. Uh, Oof, I think we oh, here it one. is. Oh, and I remember you were just like, oh, no. <laughs> But we lost our I mean, mind it, because we had never really imagined <laughs> Blipwood this this amazing. And it was like so many ideas. And Tom Owens, who was directing, had had mm -hmm. this idea about it being mm -hmm. kind of on a cliff edge and pushing it. But then mm -hmm. this chasm that you got to and, and, the, and the, the sense of like peril and all this stuff. And I remember early on, we were like, okay, we're not doing this. Tudor. We're out on Tudor. So, so many mm -hmm. of our fantasy stories, Tudor design is like all we're doing. And, and, and mm -hmm. I think that was inspiring to you. I don't think it was, it, it held you back. No, not at all. No, it was cool because Tom had some really beautiful uh, reference that he was bringing. Um, oh no, my mind's going to blank right now, of course. Uh, the the uh, famous lighting um, guru, oh my gosh. Deacons, Roger Deacons. Tom brought yes. Roger Deacons films um, in in a great variety. I think in particular, um, oh, forget it. My memory is stuck. I'm <laughs> going to function live on camera right now. Yeah, but, but Deacons had been um, a big influence because Tom had worked on How Deacons, to Train Your Dragon. They brought Deacons in as a cinematographer mm -hmm. to really influence a lot of the look of the How to Train Your Dragon series. Um, that was kind of, there was an, that was a, an age of animation and that they really started with dragons, but there were some others at Pixar and others They were starting to bring in cinematographers to affect kind of composition and use of camera and, and even look. Um, and yeah, uh, Deacon was a big influence. Yeah. Yeah. And the architecture from the Westerns that he was sort of, um, vibing with and, uh, all of that combining with that kind of classical fantasy setting was a very inspiring place to be. So thinking about, even as we visited Tennessee and kind of got a, a feeling for for that space and, and it just kind of clicked. It was like, oh, this is definitely, you know, uh, where the stories came up out of. And the uh, Igby Cottage was a big, um, or like very much influenced by the experience of having, I, I, don't, I don't have to think of that. I visited it by that point and, and met Andrew, but I'm not positive. That might not have happened. I might be mem uh, remembering that funny, but I know I looked up, uh, uh, Franklin and, and Tennessee in general to kind of get a sense of that space. Cause I, when I realized like, okay, this is where everyone's coming from kind of it's in the genes of the project. Um, some of the architectural styling from that part of the world kind of came into it. Yeah. And, and so we've got that image actually of the cottage is just behind you and I right now on the mm -hmm. stream. So people can see that, but um, that was uh, a sense of home was really important to us uh, in, in kind mm -hmm. of, committing the Igaby family to Glipwood, right? And that they, they had a space there. Um, before we get too much further, as you start listening to, in this case, or reading a story or getting attached to a project, mm -hmm. um, what's your way in? Like, what do you, what, what first springs to mind? What are the, how did things begin to visualize? Tell us a little bit about your process 
and, and it could be, I realize it could be different, but um, maybe in this case, like what were the things that came to mind first that you just had to get out and start to put down? Hmm. It's a good question. I think that, you know, story is the, the center of everything that we're doing here. Right. And so that was the, the idea was to serve and deliver the story as best as we could to people. Um, and then the art should embody that and, and sort of be imbued with the, um, the love and the warmth and the texture of the place that, that Andrew's already kind of very fully fleshed out and envisioned, um, just in words. And so the audiobook was the first place, you know, that I went and, and it's so rare, actually, the projects that I've, I've worked on. Um, I've worked across toys and TV and feature and video games a lot. And in most of those cases, we're building the bridge underneath us as we cross, you know, like it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. happening as we go. And so in this case, we had this really rich sort of whole book series in totem. <laughs> like it was, it was complete. It was there. And we could just draw from that. And, and that was where I really, I, I love that. I love trying to do that even in the situations where I'm building the road, you know, just laying the tracks down um, as we go, where I'm trying to imply uh, world building. There's so much you can do with just one prop, you know, one key item, one key, piece of a character can really um, flesh out the world in such a compelling way. And uh, and so with, with all of Andrew's like uh, the creaturepedia of all these incredible critters and the little details about the characters um, that were peppered throughout the books and, and the humor of it, it was really fun to find little like corners to hide details that, and I knew that, you know, my audience was primarily you and Andrew who knew the book so well. So in order to like sell an idea, you know, I, I definitely it behooved me to, to go and dig in the, in the story and find something that was specific to Wing Feather. Uh, yeah, that's great. And yeah. so when you think about, we've talked about this a little bit, you and I, um, but I want to bring it up here that there is something about this story in which there are things happening off the page that are that are clearly referenced in other histories and footnotes and this sort of thing. Mm. Some of the visual design starts to get at that. I think that was a Miyazaki reference where we have this more abstract feeling in the world where the audience can imagine detail that's not there. Um, you certainly evoke a ton of that in your work. Um, where, where does that... Uh, how does that get shaped? I guess, cause there's a way in which that's just like unfinished art, but then there's a way that it leads the audience to, to imagine detail that may not actually fully be there. And they have to figure out what that might be uh, and maybe how that mm. edges out of the frame. In fact, but talk about how you're able to do that with your work. That's a beautiful question. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think that the, the metaphor that I use for people when I talk about design and when I talk about coming up with these ideas is it's a little bit like telling a joke. Um, we all know what it's like to tell a story to a group of people that you think is really funny and it just doesn't land. You know, there's the silences are in the wrong space and they're the wrong length and you're adding too much information in places where you shouldn't and you should pull back. You know, it's like, why did the chicken cross the road? Well, it wasn't a road, it was more of a path and there were uh, there were fences on either side and the grass was really <laughs> tall and thick. And anyways, the chicken was there. You, you're, you're way off in the weeds at that point. And you could do that with visual design yeah. too where you're giving too much information and you're giving, you know, sort of barfing up a lot of detail and color and shape on screen. Um, but uh, I think that finding a, a great place in design and, and with Wing Feather, this was certainly the case, was trying to boil it down so that um, there's the main presentation, that first hit, that visual impression that a character gives you. And then there's one or two hidden things, little things that kind of reveal themselves as you go. And maybe they're never addressed in the script. You know, maybe they're just there for, uh, you know, somebody who looks at the art book or pauses at a certain moment to notice, but they're in there for sure. Um, yeah. And they add a sense of cred credibility without overwhelming the impression um, of the character, I think. So I don't know if that answers it or just adds more confusion to the situation. But, yeah. No, I, I, I had to pause here because one of the concepts going into this uh, for everybody at home was that we didn't want to make the traditional CGI mm -hmm. approach. So computer graphics, right, yeah. uh, Pixar obviously started this, VeggieTales did a lot of this, where um, it's a bit antiseptic. So they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, we call it modeling clay on a partly cloudy day. That by nature mm -hmm. of having to kind of 
uh, uh, bring these things to life in a real physical way in a computer uh, where there's models and rigs and, and surfaces. Um, the illustrations and work that folks like Nicholas would do inherently lose something as they translate into the computer. Um, and we were really struck, our whole team, Keith Lango and, and, and Andrew and, and then Nicholas and Tom, to say, what would it look like to stay more abstract, to kind of make what we're doing feel like you could not, it's not all there. Now, the problem is, if mm -hmm. the backgrounds are beautiful, like what you've seen from Nicholas's work, and then the character is the CG rendered smooth object on top, it, it breaks, right? The whole thing doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So the trick was, what could we do to make the characters feel like in CG they could sit with those backgrounds, those beautiful backgrounds, and actually work? And so uh, we're mm -hmm. going to talk more about the process there of getting those characters to sit in the world and to take the designs that Nicholas made and actually model those with a great modeler and then get them. To, um, but to sit in that background, one of the things that we really drove at, and I want to have you talk about this, Nicholas, is allowing the brush strokes to be visible, allowing the kind of artist hand. Uh, we've gotten a lot of comments over the years from huge studio execs to everybody that's seen our short film. This feels handcrafted. There's this paint motion feeling to it, like it's a painting coming alive. Mm. And they want to know how we did it. And there's some secret sauce, and we'll talk about maybe a little bit of that later. But from your mm. uh, seat, I know I heard you really, really pushing the artists around this about letting those strokes be where they are. Let the audience, you know, the viewer at home, see the, the handcrafted nature of that and there's there's kind of unfinished mm -hmm. parts and and talk to me about you know mm -hmm. your own work in that and then helping to kind of it's not how artists are trained they typically like to render out and hide their mistakes uh and and you really push them to like mm -hmm. you got to commit to it let it go yeah I, th I think it's all about having a clear sense of what the hierarchy is of uh, like what what's important on screen what's the the center um the focal center what what character or what thing are you looking at um but also like what's what's what are we trying to do here you know and if it's a tender moment between two characters and they the focus is on the emotion and the interaction the you know uh rivets on the kettle in the background of that shot are not necessarily uh, the most important thing on screen. And that can be lovely to, to pour into the details, but it was also the, a conscious decision we made because we knew we were, were operating in a tight budget and trying to do something that didn't look like a cheaper version of something expensive, but looked intentionally right. like itself. Um, and so we, we wanted to really find a, a smart way to design something that was beautiful and honest and painterly that left space where we didn't need to fill in all the details. And it kind of gave it a bit of a dreamlike quality at times and, and something I really loved, um, you know, was, was just that feeling that it, it did feel like a, a painting, uh, part of the art of book uh, come to life on screen in its best moments. And, um, and it's a really fun way to work, you know, as you uh, sort of, delve because we're always asking the question of like what's most important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um no matter what that's inherent to all the the design so you're never or rarely feeling like you're focused on something that no one's gonna see you know uh, and it's gonna you know make an impact yeah that's awesome yeah and i think mm -hmm. that um that shows up a lot in our big paintings right so some of like the cliff side and and um, mm -hmm. the sky paintings and things like that where you really see, and I've had people comment on like, those clouds are just a couple brush strokes. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that mm -hmm. great? You know, and I think one mm -hmm. of the things I love about this, Nicholas, is that we're really inspiring even kids at home, right? Who are just starting to like, let their drawings mm -hmm. be their drawings. Let them, let them live. Like, don't try to, you know, it's like my son has been noodling mm -hmm. around a little bit, Elijah, with um, a kind of paint and color by number, you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. fine. You know, but it's not nearly as interesting as when he just can freehand and make something, you know, um, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty special, you know, uh, so. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely. Who is your favorite character in the Wingfeather Saga world that you've designed? And of course, you did design all the characters and it's amazing, but who's your favorite and why? This is a, that's a really tough one. So don't choose your favorite child. Uh, just, just just off the cuff. I know we love them all equally. I know none of the children. <laughs> We can't pick between the siblings. That would be too much. Um, 
Uh, I mean, I love Poto as a character from the books, just in general. So I knew as soon as I read him and and the sort of I don't want to. Are we spoiler free on this podcast? Is that the or the live stream? Or are we? Yeah, be careful. Like we... we're kind of like you know okay. hinting at some of right his longer journey, but we know he's a pirate and that he did some bad yeah. things. So right, right, his past and the and the sort of. I think it's just a beautiful, sad kind of way that it's handled in the books that contrasts really love in a lovely way with the humor um, and the lightheartedness of the adventure. And uh, mm -hmm. I just, I, <laughs> if you give me a pencil and a sketchbook, there's two things that I'm going to draw. Just if you blindfolded me, I draw them. I would draw old men and I would draw dragons. I don't know why. It's just what my <laughs> hand does when my body's not paying too much attention. And um so, you know, an old man who has a particular relationship with the dragons of the story was like, I was magnetized by that for sure. Um, and of course, Jurgen the dragon would, would be the other one, you know, getting to do the big, scary kind of ancient power embodied in this, you know, of all types of dragons to a sea dragon, which is just the coolest kind. So, you know, it was great. Oh, yeah. And of course, our sea dragons have history, which we can't really reveal, but we have to think about in their design. And, and, and what that's going to do for their future. Uh, it's like so many things. I, I think a lot of times when we mm -hmm. get into the story of Wingfeather Saga, for those of us that have read the whole four book series, is that you've got this whole story all mm -hmm. set. And you're like, okay, but I'm only talking about the first part. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it can be tricky. Hey, so those of you that may be just joining us, I'm Chris Wall, executive producer of Wingfeather Saga, our animated series we're working on. This is Nicholas Cole. He was our production designer on the short film that many of you have seen. Uh, our proof of concept that came out of a Kickstarter we did back in 2016. Um, and we are currently working on funding this series. Uh, and it's using a really cool mechanism, Gregulation Crowdfunding, which basically allows you, the audience, to buy shares in our company and, and be a part of making this show uh, come to life. So it's not a Kickstarter. We are not asking you for your donations. Uh, we are not going to send you a t-shirt because you kickstarted us, right? Uh, this is about buying shares in our company. And and when we succeed, you succeed. Uh, it's super amazing. So we launched this last week on Thursday uh, evening and um, have now raised over $2.4 million uh, headed towards our $5 million, which will pay for season one. Um, we've talked a little mm -hmm. bit. I know, Nicholas, you've talked about this too but just how expensive animation is. And so animation is typically uh, left with the large studios to spend the money. And when independent studios come in, they have to spend less money and that shows up, right? The visual quality suffers uh, or the artists suffer or both. But in our case, we really wanted to come up with a different way of doing animation, right? A way to kind of get at this that would, would give a visually rich something uh, at a price point that, that isn't the million to two million dollars uh, uh, per minute that we see at the feature level. Um, and so we're super excited uh, to have all you jumping in. Uh, I want to run through, Nicholas, pause for a second. I, I won't come back to you, but I want to run through because we had a, a bunch mm -hmm. of people jumping in. Uh, Benjamin from Florida, uh, thank you, 250. Uh, Kevin uh, from Michigan, 350. By the way, this is totally a drill in my ability to pick out states. So if it gets your state wrong because the initials, I'm sorry. I'm doing my very best. Uh, I want to have Nicholas do it later. Uh, Kira from Oregon, 250. Uh, Tian from Utah, 350. Ken from Connecticut, 250. Shelby from Washington, 100. Shannon from South Carolina, 150. Robert from New York, 350. Mark from Florida, 350. Will from Texas, 350. Dowell from Texas, 500. Scott from Washington, 100. Rachel from Indiana, 400. Thank you all so much. That is just really amazing. Uh, and so we are headed towards our episode three goal. So we're funding uh, each of the episodes, six episodes we want to do in season one, which will basically take us through all of book one. Um, and so Nicholas, as you re recall, book one is definitely a lot of world building. And world building is a cool mm -hmm. thing because in a book, it takes a lot of descriptions and kind of you got to get there. But in, in our case, we can mm -hmm. show them an image, right? And it's like so many things happen right in, 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 in the, the efficiency in that process. Um, what's one of your favorite locations uh, from the short film and, and kind of the world? I mean, oh man, it's a toss up probably between Agaby Cottage and Nooks, uh, Books and Crannies. Um, we'll just say, let's, we talked about, about Agaby Cottage a bunch, but I think Books and Crannies was a really fun location to design. I mean, it's a wonderful dusty bookshop and it has all the uh the magic that 
I don't know. There's something about that setting. I mean, literally, like the the book, reading the books, uh, listening to the books, put me very much in the space of like sitting on the rug in my grandparents' house when I was a kid, like with my favorite sort of young adult novels sort of strewn around me, going through them one by one, and uh, and so the vibe of of books and crannies and and thinking about the magic and that feeling and trying to preserve that. I mean, it's it's perfect. I mean, it it really captures the essence of of the spirit of the books uh, in, a, in a lot. And there's like kind of danger and mystery. And and uh, I really liked what uh, Tom came up with uh, in terms of how to hide uh, Oscar's character as kind of a, a disembodied voice through a series of tubes and like a portrait. And I got to do the portrait of, of Oscar, who is yet another uh, old man in a story about dragons. So I, was, <laughs> I had a good time with him too. <laughs> yep. That's so great. Well, uh, so much of the work you did ended up having to get translated into CG. And so I wanted to bring in our dear friend, Keith Lango. Keith. Hey, Keith's around? here. Can you jump in here? I'm a dear there friend. He is. <laughs> hey, buddy. Um, but, see, I'm going hey, to use that when somebody says, you're going to die alone with no friend. Gonna be, I, I am, it has been said out loud by a human being that I am a dear friend. So I love yeah, it. There it is. <laughs> Man, it's been a while since three of us. <laughs> a friend of beers, actually. It's a... Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's still a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been it's been a few years. Uh, it's good to have you guys here. Keith, we were chatting here with Nicholas about some of his world design. And I know you've talked a lot about um, how we blend CGI uh, with this kind of hand-painted background. And Nicholas brought you some really strong hand-painted work. Uh, tell us a little bit about the challenge and kind of in, in summary, how you get CGI, I mentioned it, to, to actually sit with these wonderful paintings and, and world that Nicholas had made. Um, lots of luck. And uh, no, actually the thing you do is uh, you have to understand what you're working with. Um, for the entirety of its existence, computer graphics imagery, CGI, has been geared towards and indexed to replicating realism uh, with the, the highest level of fidelity possible. Every major advancement in the technology for 40 years is usually marked by it looks more real, which, you know, when you're doing movies like Lord of the Rings or stuff like that, where you're trying to mix live action people, you know, on a camera with, you know, digital creations, it's great when the digital stuff looks real. Um, and it's not so great when it doesn't. Uh, but that's, that's like, that's our tool. Um, the problem is the tool doesn't really like to do stuff that isn't real. Um, it kind of struggles at it sometimes and it's getting better. A lot of smart, clever people are coming up with some solutions to this and probably in the last 10 years, but I've been, I've been poking at it for 20 or so. And, um, the big thing is you just have to understand uh, the concept of cohesion. Um, there has to be like a cohesiveness to it, uh, in the sense that, if, you're, if your backgrounds are loose brush paintings and they're very impressionistic and they don't really have a lot of specific detail and um, they're abstracted in a sort of way, like if you look at any, like the stuff that, that Nicholas did and all the backgrounds we use in the short films, those are all, they're abstracted. Like he's not trying to paint photorealism. So whatever you put in CG has to employ the same kinds of, um, same kinds of approach like you, you you can't have a realistic character in front of a ba painted background without causing some kind of weird you know incoherent disconnect in the mind of the viewer um and in fact and it, the thing that made interesting to me was it isn't necessarily quote unquote quality um that is not it's not determined by how detailed something is quality is determined by how cohesive it is for instance i mean we are what 87 years into The Simpsons now, um, it, it works because the whole thing's put together. And when we, if you take a look at SpongeBob, you got SpongeBob, you know, this, this, this you know, cell drawn kind of thing. And when they want to make something funny, they put a live action shot in there. Or they'll do this super detailed, you know, painting that's completely different out of the style. And that's funny because it's like, well, that doesn't belong there. That's, a, that's why it's funny. It's incoherent. Um, but you can't live in incoherence because then nothing makes sense. Um, so, you know, people will play along and watch whatever it is. If you tell them up front, this is the rules, the visual rules of our world. Like, this is what coherence means. 
It's an impressionistic world. Motion is not high fidelity. Um, models do not retain perfect um, you know, structural integrity at all times. Uh, textures are not permanent and fixed. It's not like we spray painted a maquette and we're sliding it around in front of a camera. But the textures themselves are, are changing on a you know on an n number of frames basis. And if you put all those things in there, like the motion isn't smooth, the drawings aren't smooth, the the painting isn't smooth, the 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 models don't remain smooth, the the lighting even you know all these things. If there's a kind of a toothy toothiness to it, you know, like it, that's the only way I can describe it. If you're an art person, you have to, you know, you, you want, you know, drawing paper, you know, if you want some really fun character to your paper, you know, you don't get the super smooth stuff. You get toothy stuff. that has got nooks and crannies and hills and bumps and all kinds of weird irregularities in it because that in and of itself will kind of tear at this, this detail. And the great thing is, even a tiny little child has the imagination from the womb to fill in the blanks. And it's great when we do fill in the blanks because what we're doing is instead of saying, you know, I don't, I don't mean this in a, in a bad way, but like a super high realism CGI is like taking the food, putting it on a spoon and delivering it to the mouth of your mind and saying there, and it's pre-chewed and everything. It's like applesauce. You, know, you don't have to do anything because it's all there. You don't have to interpret it. It is what it is we're making stuff that is like here's a here's a chunk of beef digest it and so there's activity that has to happen you know the mind and the imagination has to engage so even though the stuff looks you know less detailed it is actually more engaging than the stuff that is super high detailed and super realistic because we yeah and that's like, it's super counterintuitive i just got to tell you because when you first pitched this to me we were up at, at, at Keith's place, everyone, uh, in, in the cold winter of 2015 uh, when we first started this process and we were thinking about how this could work and you were like, hey, here's the deal. What we actually need to do is go this direction. And, we were, and Tom and I were like, really? Because that feels counterintuitive. Um, and yet I remember vividly in, in 2016 uh, when you did that first interview with Nichols, do you remember this? when it was the first thing with Janner talking for the first time and we kind of got to see it all yes. happen. And it was like, I just oh, watched it. There today. Is. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. That, yeah, I did. I, I was going through the folder of, of stuff and I immediately, I don't know if it's, if I was allowed, I grabbed that shot and saved it forever. I was like, oh, as, so if we can hit this, you know, then yeah. we're going to be all right. Yeah. yeah. That's the benchmark. And that Keith was kind of this became this like visual bar of like, okay, if we can do this over a whole run and, you know, uh, we did one of the things that happened. So just so we're clear. So 2016, we worked in the short film, it released end of, um, sorry, it, 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 2016 to 17, uh, and released at the end of 17, uh, just after we had released it. Uh, and this, this question was, was around in our minds, like would any studio or any, uh, network that we went to, cause we're out for that buddy. Uh, uh, would they accept non-traditional CGI or would they be like, no. And thankfully, uh, a little film called Spider-Man Spider-Verse came out and it kind of set the whole place on its heels like, yep, yep, we can. Uh, and it was just I was vindicated a, a, a is what you're boost. saying. The whole industry bent its will to vindicate me and my crazy it idea. Did. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we all were feeling the same problem, which is like, we're seeing too much of the same thing. What can we do to change it? And it's been so cool to yeah. see some of the others doing similar work um, uh, and just making really cool stuff. So we're super excited. Uh, if you're just joining in, I'm Chris Wall, I'm the executive producer. This is Keith Lango. He's our CG supervisor and uh, a kind of wizard uh, coming up with ways to make that technology do what we want it to. And this is uh, Nicholas Cole. <laughs> who's our production designer on the short film uh, and just a brilliant character designer and artist and um, really brought this world to life. And um, Nicholas, one other thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap up here, um, as we brought on um, different artists, uh, uh, there was there was a need to kind of bring the visual style together and you have such a distinct style. Uh, talk to me about the process of working with some of those artists and then I want to ask Keith a similar question because, of course, all those elements have to come together and there's a secret sauce we have to do called compositing. But uh, thinking about the artists and getting a unifying look, uh, what were some of the techniques that, that maybe you did? Because you have a team of people and they all got to kind of come together. Um, tell me about some of that process. 
Well, I mean, it all starts with picking the right people to begin with, right? And uh, we were moving fast uh, and and had a lot of stuff to produce really quickly. Um, and I racked my brain and, and went through all my friend groups and, and everybody I could think of um, who had something in their style that already really spoke to the, the aesthetic that was emerging for the show to begin with. Um, and we vetted folks and, and, and brought uh, as many people aboard as we could. Um, I think it was, you know, there, you could see it in someone's portfolio that there's already a quality there and, and, and a yeah. capacity to learn. And that was the other big thing that we were looking for to begin with was like people who could like think on their feet. And, and that was great. It was so much fun. But when we really got down to like trying to, to bring the style together, we were all coming each other's ways and trying to borrow certain things from each other, different types of brushstrokes. Uh, uh, Justin Oxford was very generous when he uh, joined up and and shared his brushes with with the rest of the environment kind of crew. Yeah, and so we that. had yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of a common pool of brushes and textures and that sort of stuff. But I had to like go and and break down my process, um, which is a weird thing for an artist to do, um, especially the kind of artist that I am, right? Where it's uh, I'm hired to do the thing, not necessarily to teach or explain the thing as often, um, and so trying to find a way to break down what I was already laying down intuitively into like steps and yeah, pieces and in particular with the, the black carriage we did. Mm. Yeah. I think didn't he do the cliff scene. Let's put, is that yours or is that one? He his? did. No, that's Justin. Yeah. That's all Justin. Yeah. And it just, it's yeah, so that stunning. was that my favorite in. background of the whole project. It's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The key that's thing was cool. trying to get, scale that's the tricky thing is like when you're doing these big brush strokes and you're setting characters in front of it trying to make sure that when a foot hits the ground that the blades of grass no matter how brush strokey are sort of correctly scaled to that character so that you believe it yep. you know as opposed to just having huge hairy brush strokes right near where the character is going to sit and so getting that fine fine tuning glip wood in the distance of that shot was something we spent a lot of time on trying to get that to read hey, so as, Keith, as far away I want to come to you it. now and talking about Sorry. taking those pieces and those elements to kind of together, but we got to pause for a second here. Uh, okay. Need a little bit of stretch. Cause I've just gotten word that we're in what they call the downhill stretch. So we have officially got the halfway. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. 2.5 million. Uh, how did we get there? How in the world did we get there? Uh, that's amazing. So in one week, $2.5 million. That's, that is amazing. Okay. And I just, I go back to this, but I've told you folks before, there were so many pitch rooms that we went into and told about this project and how great it was. And, and, and it's in this middle space. It's this middle space where it's not a Christian fantasy novel, nor is it secular fantasy. It's something that, that stirs at a longing, gets to the back of your neck. It's like, it is a descendant of Lord of the Rings and Narnia, these places that just kind of stories that mess with us that that come more alive when we come out of the story because we see the world around us in this new way which is alive and and it was, we were just told so many times that nah, people aren't into it and i'm like we think they are and so you are actually participating in telling that to to everyone that yes we want this story thank you ah so good how do we get here uh here's how robin uh from iowa 500 bucks leah from texas 100 dollars Don from Idaho, 100 bucks. Joel from Virginia, 350. Jack from New Mexico, 350. Logan from Pennsylvania, 350. Drew from South Carolina, 500. Uh, and then let's see, Christopher from Washington, 500. Michael from Tennessee, hello, Tennessee, 250. Frank from Virginia, 500. <laughs> Sherry from North Carolina, 500. Rebecca from Wisconsin, good cheese, 100 bucks. And, and I know that feels weird, like 100 bucks and this at a time, uh, but let me be clear. Uh, it is, it is, really important that that um we have a lot of people here because we all get to share in this like it, it is so we had some dear friends the haas family who are just wonderful bill and Jeannie, who have been just really big cheering us on supporters and they've told us over the years like let's share in the joy of what's happening here as best we can and and we just kind of scratched our head because andrew and i were like well, what's the vehicle to do that though like we don't know how to do that and and here's how we're doing it and and thank you and i want to pause and say I know who this person is, I think, but we have uh, uh, Dan from Illinois uh, who jumped in with $100,000. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Wow. Uh, that is amazing. And thank you for, for pushing us along and helping the series to come to life. 
uh, I appreciate that 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 confidence that you've given us in investing with us. Thank you so much. Um, it is quite a feeling. Uh, we had set up for a 28 day campaign, uh, and and we're not going to go that long. I don't think, folks. Uh, we're weekend and and over two and a half million dollars. Is that crazy? That is amazing. So, um, wow. Okay. We're here talking with our dear friends, Nicholas Cole and, and Keith Lango. Keith and I worked uh, uh, together a little bit at Big Idea while working on VeggieTales. We got to do some fun stuff together and was one of the first calls I made where I said, Keith, I want to tackle animation, but do it weird and do it differently. <laughs> I don't want to do it the regular way. Uh, what do you got in your back pocket? And we went to your place in Spokane and started messing around with stuff. Um, Nicholas talked about these wonderful paintings, getting them in, and then we've got this animation. How do we get it all to sit together? And you talked a little bit about some of the movement and, and, and layering and compositing, but tell a little bit about that sauce and how it, the final image that they see in the short film comes together. Um, that's where there's a lot of tech involved in it, but there's, there's a certain uh, mind and heart of the artist that is absolutely necessary. You have to have the eye to see where things are working and where they're not. And you have to then know which thing do I need to change to get them to all work together. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the compositing side of it is like, that's, that's really where, you know, those guys are the chefs, uh, if for lack of a better expression, you know, the animators, they're providing really great motion. The background painters are providing really great backgrounds. The VFX people are providing really great VFX. Um, Texture people put in great textures, modeling people make great models, but you need somebody to take all these raw ingredients and like a master chef, put it together and put the right speed, right spice, right seasoning, right proportion of this, right proportion of that. Uh, I mean, you can ruin any dish by putting too much salt in it, but you can also ruin a dish by leaving no salt in it whatsoever. So it really is the artist's eye and it's great to have compositors who are really experienced and understand um, what it is we're trying to accomplish. And it takes a little, it takes, well, not a little, it takes a lot of experimenting, like where you just kind of go through and the thing that, you know, you guys were talking about that, that kind of, you know, set the bar animated shot that I did in 2016. I had 50 versions of that maybe, um, where I'm just like, I do it and I come back, you know, and look at it I'm like, oh, okay, that isn't quite right. Let me try this. Let me try that. Oh, what if I had this thing in here? Um, you're just kind of sprinkling in different sauces and seasonings and stuff. And it's really just working with the raw materials that you have and deciding how you want to blend them together. And okay, this one, I want to put it on there, but I'll tell you what, I want to move it instead of just having it sitting there. Let's go have that move across the screen a little bit. Oh, I got this other layer right here, dust moods. Well, if I put them in there, now they're too bright, but without it, it feels kind of dead. Let me put them in there and let me go ahead and uh, make them only like 25% opacity so that they're mostly transparent, but you kind of feel them more than see them, you know, stuff like that. Um, Having the, the background art and the, and the concept art, especially the color keys, earlier on in the process are fantastic. Like Nicholas, fantastic work of putting together the color keys so that we had like a, a touchstone, a Rosetta Stone of like, this is what we'd like the thing to feel like. Um, mm. Our old statement from the beginning was so many of these great big animated films um, give you the buttered down, you know, highly polished stuff. And we love it. It's good. But then the art of book comes out a year or two later. And then you look at the art of book and you look at all this inspiring, amazing artwork. And you're like, why couldn't we get that on screen? So our goal is to take, you know, the beautiful artwork that Nicholas and his team are doing and bring that to the screen, but animate it and make it alive and make it not just a picture you look at in a book that you have to turn the page, but it's something you can watch. And there's voices and there's music and there's, that, that level of involvement that you just books art books are great but there's something else about just watching a show and just letting it suck you into the world and, and tell you the story yeah that's so good and i gotta i get now that you said that now i just gotta find that shot because it's just so I, nicholas i'm sorry i didn't have that <laughs> right handy but uh i remember that that those color keys um we printed them as big as we could and had them on the wall for everybody to see like this is what it should feel like all the way through and in it they were evocative um great work hey uh last question for nicholas i forgot i had one more for you um 
And that is, you know, when we got back to the books here, these hardcover books, uh, uh, Andrew reached out and said, hey, could we get you to bring these covers to life? But here's the deal. I don't want it to look exactly like the series. I want it to look like a little bit different uh, and for the characters to be a little different. And he didn't want the, the movie book where it's like literally the same thing as the, as the TV series might have. Um, how challenging was that to take something you had visualized? And obviously you had a couple of years different, so maybe it's like <laughs> reworking something, but how challenging was it to make something fresh for these uh, awesome book covers? I mean, that's the, the funny thing about this question is that it wasn't challenging <laughs> at all. I think that if anybody here is, is also artistically inclined, or I think most people who are just creative, and and uh, in any way, um, your work a few years later just does not feel the same to you as it did at the moment that you were doing it. So when Andrew came back around with the book covers, you know, it was a completely different problem to solve. So there's that aspect, and that's the the major one. But then also in the background, it was like, oh, I definitely want another swing at this. You know, like I would I would love to take another whack at it. But I think what the chief difference between a book cover and what we did for the animated uh, short um, is that. You know, a character design, uh, a environment illustration, you know, a, a designer and illustration, the color script, they're all just pieces intended to uh, sort of fit into a certain part of the process and create a cohesive whole, as Keith was saying, something that has a consistency through all of it. But an illustration for the cover of one of the books has to be all of that at once together with all the other departments and things. It has to fire on all those cylinders very quickly. And instead of just being able to design Janner, it has to be sort of a version of Janner that embodies that whole arc and his kind of spirit in that book. And um, and also, I mean, even beyond that, one of the main things I wanted was to make sure that I was grabbing people's attention, you know, right off the bat. Um, yeah. Do something that's consistent with the books, but something that really like leapt off the shelf. And so I really tried to imagine being 14 and in a Barnes and Noble and looking around and like, what would, what would the sort of thing be that would really like cause me to just shoot my arm out and grab something? Man, it was really and that fun. has been the case. I've gotten to walk through some Barnes and Noble and other bookstores and and I, the old book covers were were amazing and kind of imaginative and took me in, but these have a way of just popping off the shelf uh, in a really special way. Mm -hmm. uh, and you did a great job, so congratulations on that. Um, the books have sold very well, so we'll say Nicholas Cole, good job. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Nicholas, Google gold so badge for taking it to my grave. Time. There you go. Thank you so much. For, you know, I think it'd be lovely. I was just thinking about this. This is totally off the cuff, but. Uh, we were talking about this on the front end that everybody who's who's in, investing here with us and buying shares in our company, that that I, I, is it wonderful life. Anyways, there's there, there, where, where you would have like printed shares. It would say I own one share. Mm. Da, 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 you know this whole thing. Um, we should totally do a wing feather design share that people could print at home and say I have you know 100 shares of Wing Feather Saga season one series. Mm. <laughs> It'd be so cool. Uh, okay, well Nicholas, thank you for taking time tonight to spend with us. So good to have you. So good to see you. Um, Keith, so appreciate you jumping in here. Uh, we've got Nicholas is all the way up in Vancouver. Uh, I'm down here in Nashville, uh, and Keith's up in Spokane. Uh, so we are all over the place. Um, and I want to be in a room with you guys again soon. It's been way too long. Thank you for jumping in with us, guys. Uh, Lord haste the day. And, yeah, mm -hmm. we're on the downhill run here, folks. Uh, we'll talk to you guys again soon. Thanks so much, Chris. This is great. Thanks. Hey, good to see you. See you, buddy. Hey, so um, it it has just been an amazing evening. We at, at, I got to get the updated total. Hold on. So we started this year at uh, two point four million dollars tonight, and um, thanks to a number of you jumping in, and of course uh, some significant contributors, um, we're ending this evening uh, up here at two point five five. So we are on the downhill stretch. It's only been a week. It's only been a week. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Uh, I want to call out a couple more people here, and then I have uh, two more special guests before we close out tonight, and then a special video to show you. So don't go away, because I got a fun video and two more special guests to show you. Um, okay, so uh, let me run through these. I, I think I called some of these out, but I'll say them again. Rebecca from Wisconsin. Yeah, I did that. Rebecca uh, from Kansas, 100 bucks. Amanda from Idaho, 100 bucks. Tim from South Carolina, 100 bucks. Paul from Illinois, 150. Nathaniel from Pennsylvania, 350. 
Jason from Georgia, 500. Thank you, Jason. That is very cool. Um, okay, so I mentioned to you all that uh, last week we did something really crazy. We started this on Thursday night, and by Saturday, 48 hours into it, something really special happened. And, and, and that was you all giving us amazing fuel to get going. And we made a little video here we wanted to show you it's just what that felt like to us on this end. Uh, so take a look at this. And I hope people are really excited about our show, but um, last night got the message uh, and it just, it's unbelievable. Hey folks, so I am out here at Twin Arches in Tennessee. It's this amazing formation because I spent the weekend camping with uh, our scouts and uh, horseback riding and checking my phone uh, because there was rumors that we might hit a million dollars in investments, uh, which I was like, eh, I don't think we're gonna, I mean, I hope people are really excited about our show, but um, last night got the message uh, and it just, it's unbelievable what that means, um, both to me and, and for Andrew both. Um, we, I personally have believed in this story for so long. Our family read it and just loved it and, and it moved us um, so much. Uh, the, the kind of work that it does in dealing with um, questions of how we deal with our sin and how we deal with our brokenness and how we deal with um, our identities and, and the things we put on ourselves and and kids in a, in a world that's broken and finding a way to uh, bond as a family and move through it. So the um, support uh, that we've seen in these past just 48 hours of fans and just people who believe in this kind of story has been overwhelming. It really, <laughs> um, it's just, it's quite a moment. And so thank you. Uh, for those of you that have stepped in and, and invested with us, uh, it's funny, the sen I, I can't really explain this to you, but the sense that we have of what that investment means, that like, okay, now we're responsible to carry this forward. Uh, we don't take it lightly, um, and it means the world. Um, and I look forward to uh, getting to work and getting an excellent crew uh, rolling on this to make uh, a really <clears throat> special series that hasn't been seen before. So thank you. Eric invested a thousand. Gary, thank you. Three hundred fifty dollars. You're not just giving; you're investing. Ah, one, Jamie. One point nine four seven. Holy smokes, people! Oh my goodness! Amazing. I don't even know what to say. <clears throat> this is so much better than like go into like some studio in Hollywood and just signing on the dotted line and them doing it, but. The fact that you guys are a part of the whole thing and that we're experiencing this together. Huh, I just never would have thought that this would have been so cool. It has been a long journey, folks, and we have met so many obstacles. You have no idea. People that just said, ah, there's no chance. Um, anything with this kind of content just doesn't work. You guys coming alongside of us here. Um, thank you. Uh, wow. Uh, I'm just so shocked. Um, thank you. It's been a wild evening. It's been a wild week uh, of just so much support. And I want you to know what it means to us, to our family. Um, and so I have a couple guests with us here. This is Charlotte Wall, who's our youngest, Hello. and Elijah. And uh, they have been a big part of this journey too. So uh, one note, Charlotte, this last year, got to read Wing for the Saga for the first time. Yeah. She's nine. And so she actually got to hang out and do the read aloud um, Thing that Andrew did on Facebook and YouTube uh, starting last year during quarantine and you got to hear the story for the first time yeah. and uh, it was pretty amazing huh what was your favorite part of Wingfeather Saga my favorite part is when um, Janner and Kalmar find out that there is a way that they can work with how, how don't, don't, don't spoil it. stuff yeah um, mm, things and Kalmar's new Thing. His kingship, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, you <laughs> can a great job. just work with it, yeah. even though it would be. It is it, very it, the strange. way the siblings work together, right? Yeah. That they that, that you have, we have six children, but but Calvin and Elijah and Charlotte are very similar in kind of that Janner, Kalmar, and Lily. 
you know, yeah. and, um, and the other way in which these guys have been really connected is, so when we were making the short film, a lot of times when you start off in animation, you do um, scratch tracks. And so you have people come in and just kind of lay stuff down and it's people around the studio just kind of doing it. And we all kind of record voices quickly. And then we use that for the storyboard artists and to make your animatics, which is where you edit the storyboards together. And um, in that, I said, hey, Charlotte, it was around Christmas. I said, hey, could you come join? And we went into our clothes closet where it's good and quiet. And we had the iPhone, I think. Yeah. And we said, can you just read this for me? And, and, and so she just read the script as we went. Yeah. And, and became the voice of Lily for the short film. And then Elijah got to do the same thing. And be the voice of Kalmar, uh, which was so much fun. Now, unintentionally, I ended up being the voice of Janner. Uh, yeah. We, uh, we had planned to replace me and actually audition some kids, but Elijah's voice uh, sounded too close to the kid we had uh, that, uh, that was a great cast. Uh, and so we ended up staying with my voice, which I, that's a huge spoiler. So if you hear it now, now you can only see this bearded guy as this kid. <laughs> But uh, what was, Elijah, what was your favorite part of kind of getting to play Jan or play Kalmar and, and be that voice? Because he was kind of my personality where he's kind of like wild and like crazy. Yeah, he's definitely got a, a ready fire aim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't hard to imagine him falling off the rooftop and that stuff. Like, yeah, yeah that was yesterday. Yeah. When I, when I watched it, I was like, yeah, that's definitely Elijah. That's right. And then Lily is so funny because she's so spirited, you know, and so she does have to work with her injured leg and, and requires a crutch, but, but doesn't mean she can't take care of herself. And, and Charlotte, you're very much that same way, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so she felt that. And it was so cool. From a production standpoint, we really wanted to have children voicing the characters, and that'll be the intention on the series going forward. Um, they've been asking if they get to audition again, and, and, and I'm sure we'll let them audition again. Uh, they've gotten older, so I may not have the right voice anymore. I don't know. But thank you guys for jumping in here yeah. and saying hello. Folks, it's been a great night, and it's been an amazing uh, uh, journey this last week. Um, uh, you know, it's, you're literally kind of shaking the industry. I want you to know how much power this I mean, the you're going to see a lot of news and articles next week because there's a lot of people going, wait, what are they investing in? A fantasy series? Like what? And, and it is really amazing. Someone asked on one of the comment boards about um, comparing us to The Chosen, which we love. I think Chosen is just an amazing yeah. show. Um, and it's, and yeah, we all love it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's really great. <laughs> and, uh, and getting people to watch The Chosen has kind of a missional thing underneath it, right? You want them because you want them to, to, to maybe meet this person of Jesus. And like, it's, you know, it has like something underneath it. In a fantasy series, we don't have the same call to action, right? We're saying, we're going to submerge you in a story that's going to make you feel differently about the world around you. And it's going to kind of, kind of change you and, and kind of get to the, tickle you in the back of the neck a little bit. Um, and that's, that's a really special thing. And you all have stepped in and said, yes, we want that feeling. Yes, we want to believe uh, that that can happen in our in our regular life, and and it is so great. Tell your friends. So people keep asking, what's the next thing? Don't don't try to. If you've invested with us, that's awesome. If you haven't invested, you better hurry up because we have the potential to kind of move quickly, and then you'd miss it. That happened for a whole lot of people with chosen on the first round. They were like, oh, come right over round two, and then that didn't happen, and they missed out. And and we'd love to have as many of you that are part of our journey and are wing feather fans to join with us. So if you've invested, thank you, and that's awesome. Um, don't feel like you have to give, you have to invest more. Uh, that's, that's not what we're asking, but tell your friends, uh, because getting the word out is, is one of the more challenging things that we do, right? Um, we have a lot of great people working really hard to kind of find ways to, to tell our story to other groups. Um, and it, it, there, this is a subtle story we're telling. And so it requires, um, good people like you to help tap someone on the shoulder and say, Hey, do you know about this? And you might think, Oh, everybody knows about it. Trust me. They don't. And when you tap them on the shoulder, they go, Oh, Thank you, and uh, so it's great. Um, I got a couple more to call out here. Uh, Caleb from California, uh, $500. Uh, Colin from Oregon, $1,000. Katie from Texas, $600. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it, it really means a ton. We're a week into this, folks. Uh, we've got a really fun live stream next Thursday, so be sure to tune in next Thursday. Uh, we have a really fun uh, lineup for you. If we make it that long, there's, there's a question that you guys may go faster and we don't get to, oh, we just had Chris from Georgia 
invest a thousand dollars. Uh, that's a thousand dollars that you have shares in our company. Thank you. Uh, Three thousand five hundred people have uh, believed in us, and that is really special. So um, I want to show you uh, just uh, just from the bottom of our hearts the, the most gratitude. Um, I, I I know that seems like dumb, but uh, every time you guys tune in and, and check out with us, um, um, it means the world. Uh, tag somebody, put put something in the comments, uh, share it with other people, and uh, and let them know about what we're doing over here, uh, so they can be a part. I, it's gonna it's gonna be awful when the door closes and they missed, uh, and you're like, oh yeah, I got to be a part of it. I'm sorry you didn't. <laughs> now don't be mean if that's intentional, but uh, yeah, that's what we want to do. Thank you all for joining in with us, um, and uh, I think we've gotten everybody in here. Oh, Amelia. Uh, from Tennessee, thank you, uh, $100. Uh, that's amazing. Okay, so for our end of the evening, we're headed towards our episode three goal of 2.7, which I think we're going to probably hit um, maybe tomorrow or the next day. But um, uh, yeah, thank you for joining with us and having a great conversation with Nicholas Cole and Keith Lango. Um, we're so glad you joined with us and I uh, hope you guys have a lovely evening and we'll see you next week, uh, Thursday. Take care.